Well, interesting enough, with one of the books, I tried the iBook version <laughs> and I couldn't work with it on my iPad. I, I don't know why it was kind of complicated for me. So I have to switch to a regular PDF, which is what I'm used to. So I could read it. And uh, Okay, so the iBook version didn't work well for you? No, the iBook version, no. It was, I'm, I'm not used to. No, fair enough. Yeah, so it was like I was trying to navigate and it will send me back. And sometimes it will switch the page. I mean, it's just a matter of getting used to it. I will have to, but since we needed to focus on the reading, I just said, no, I'm going to read the PDF. Yes, now the advantage of the iBook version is that you can play videos and access links more easily than with the PDF version. Yes, I, I noticed that. Are these books like, they're not complete versions or the ones we're reading are just parts or this is the whole book? Uh, they're drafts, essentially. They're, they haven't been published through the iBook store. Uh, but what you can do is you can produce your own iBooks and put them on your own server and share them that way, which is what I've been doing with yours. So they haven't gone through the full process of being made into a proper textbook. Okay, Hades. Um, yes, you can only open the iBooks version if you have an Apple computer or an iPad device. Um, that's why I also provide the... Oh, you do have that? Um, okay, then you should be able to download them and then open them in iBooks Reader. Uh, you may need to install that software if it's not part of the standard um, I, uh, iBook, uh, sorry, MacBook um, configuration. I can't quite recall whether or not it, the iBook viewer is a standard part of the operating system or if you have to download it. Um, I suspect you might have to download that. On iPads and so forth, you have the iBooks Reader as a standard um, app, but I'm not certain about the actual um, laptop or PC equivalent. And welcome, Adrian. Okay, well, let's get started with some questions. Um, from our text this evening. The first one is on information and communication technologies. Most of these are still quite relevant today. Um, there's a few links that have broken and things of that nature. These books were developed a number of years ago now. And they start off quite simply by going through the fundamental technologies that uh, we generally have available, such as PowerPoint and Keynote and um, things of that nature. So do we have any questions? <laughs> Please don't actually, shake actually, <laughs> actually, I don't have any questions because I think the book is pretty self-explanatory. You know, when you go through like how you could use uh, Prezi and how it can be used in the classroom and things like that, and actually how you can be a uh, you uh, Prezi, you ambassador. I used the Prezi several times for for presentations, so I'm very familiar with that one because I never liked PowerPoint mm -hmm. because for me PowerPoint tends to be kind of a static, and like it says, usually people tend to do the same, you know, using order list and things like that, and a lot of graphics, but sometimes it's just not enough. While Prezi actually the movement, I mean, it, it gives a certain flow and you can work it actually at like a mind map some, sometimes. So you can go back to the center and then move in a different direction. And Keynote is basically the same, but I never use the, the application and the iPad. But I think it, this is, these are pretty self-explanatory. I don't know if anyone has any questions regard, regarding this. Um, I, I remember at school we had the interactive whiteboards and Basically, right now they are 
obsolete and collecting dust because no teacher would use them. The only teacher that would use it would be the technology teacher in his classroom. So he had a, a laptop computer and everything, but none of the rest of the staff used it. Yes, that can be a challenge. Um, unfortunately, the barriers to using technology can present problems and interactive whiteboards required a certain approach. Um, they did provide classrooms with nice digital projectors and that tended to be the main purpose and benefit from their introduction. But unless you got into the actual specific apps that were developed for different um, proprietary interactive whiteboard systems, they didn't prove to be that popular with just casual use in classrooms. So Adrian asks, these technologies are more common these days. Oops, just lost your chat. Um, I've not seen a polling device anywhere somehow. Um, yes, polling devices have come and gone because of the introduction of um, smartphones and, and tablets. They were very popular a number of years ago when participants in lectures and classrooms didn't tend to have their own devices. But now that most students have their own laptops or smartphones or tablet devices, we tend to use those as polling devices more than the dedicated tools that were rolled out a number of years ago now. But their time has pretty much come and gone. Um, of course, they've really become redundant with the ubiquity of uh, personal di digital devices. So, Hadis and Adrian, do you have any other comments about the first section of the ICT text? I don't know if this has ever happened to any of you, but in my classes, that's when I stopped using the whiteboard altogether because I would copy something and they would not take notes. Instead, they will take pictures and keep them on their phone. So whenever I ask something, they would just go back to their, their phone and start browsing the pictures and give me answers. So what I started doing was actually sending them uh, maps, uh, mind maps, or screen captures or PDF files so they will read them at home and it turned to be quite effective. Yes, an approach that I'm finding quite useful is to require students to create summaries and post those after um, lectures and classes. Um, and that then also incorporates the additional readings that they would find on their on their course web pages and learning management systems. So forcing students to actually summarize and synthesize the various materials and presentations they receive does tend to engage them more than the passivity of a lot of lectures. And yes, you're right, if students can record what is presented um, using photos or video, or more commonly at university now, where they can actually have their lecture recorded automatically and provided as a digital video and the PowerPoint presentation slides provided, that does reduce their, their need to create notes. But the research does show quite clearly that creating notes and going through the process of structuring and ordering what they've um, been exploring in the lesson or lecture does help students develop the, the understanding of those concepts. Um, note taking mirrors to a certain extent the processes in the brain of creating connections between concepts. And there's a lot of research that supports the effectiveness of note taking. Um, but it is difficult because we do provide a lot of technologies that means that students don't technically need to take notes. So convincing them of the of the need or having mechanisms to um, encourage or force them to actually take notes can be an alternative. But what do people think about that? So Adrian mentions, I would use simpler PowerPoints or different um, slide contents. 
than the ones I distribute to students after class, so they would need to attend class to take notes. Yes, that's another good option. Um, Hi, can anyone hear me? Yes, we can. Right, yeah. Um, I think sometimes students interpret things differently. So, um, and taking notes is also good because then they can relate the theory or a case study to their own particular context. Um, again, this applies differently at different levels, like undergraduates uh, um, compared to master students. Master students would take notes um, in a different light, how it relates to their own experiences, whereas undergraduates, um, they take notes for perhaps different purposes. If they are going to be given a multiple choice um, based assessment later on, so the purpose of taking notes could be different. It could be more motivated by trying to get tips out from the lecturer instead. So yeah, I think taking notes has different dimensions to it and different purposes. No, you're absolutely correct. Um, and we do need to think about that because note taking really evolved from the times when uh, monks used to travel around universities and read out from very scarce texts and students would actually then copy those texts and that was the origin of, of the lecture and we sort of kept doing that all up until very recent times when instead of students having to buy textbooks students would copy down all of the notes that the lecturer presented and i remember in my own undergraduate days a lot of lectures were simply copying notes the lecturer would rarely speak they would simply just be writing notes onto the um, the blackboard or the or the projector system and our role was to make copies of those uh, for our own use and study afterwards there was very little interactivity or performance in the lecture space that certainly has changed a lot nowadays um, mostly because of the introduction of PowerPoint so PowerPoint while it has its negatives has changed the dynamics of the lecture experience dramatically um, but you're, you're totally correct. It really does come down to what the purpose is of that um, lecture or note-taking process that we want to engage students with. If it's simply memorization, that's a very different purpose than engaging them in higher order thinking or other concepts that we're trying to develop with students. Any other thoughts from anyone? Okay, well, let's look at this, the next little section. Uh, this is where we look at interactive whiteboards, tables, and tablets. Um, a lot of this has changed over the recent years. Interactive whiteboards have pretty much been now replaced with uh, data screens, um, big, big screen TVs. They can also have interactivity in terms of touch screen but tend to be more effective. Digital tablets or tables did prove popular for a few years, and there were a couple of schools exploring them, but generally only as showcase items uh, in their libraries or special showcase spaces for their new buildings. They don't tend to be implemented in large numbers in schools, which is a little bit of a pity because they do have some affordances that many of the other technologies don't have around group work and um, engagement with the apps that are available on those Surface devices. But the biggest change has come because a lot of students now have their own digital devices. So relying upon collective devices has become less important. Uh, if every student has their own tablet, then you don't need a big table tablet or even a tablet on a wall for them to interact with because they can all interact through their own uh, devices. But that said, there is a lot of um, consideration in the future that we may have uh, almost every surface being interactive and as a display environment. And there's a number of little video clips I've included. If you're only using the PDF version and you want to see the video clips, let me just share this with you so I can show you. 
I do tend to provide access to the video clips, but not where you would expect. Whoops, where have I gone? Uh, sorry, I seem to have just dropped out there for a second. Okay. So while there's little video clips in the text here, if you scroll back up to the top and the here, like movie 1.5, Smart Classrooms, that should be a link that you can then click on, even though you're using a PDF. And if the video still exists, it will then play for you. So that's just as a way of getting access to the links that you can't click on because it's a PDF in the actual text. Um, whereas in the iBooks version, you can click on those. Now, the big part of the interactive tablet table devices and tablets and whiteboards and so forth was the use of these things called interactives, which were small little applications that allowed students to play games and engage with various concepts. And they were framed around a format called learning objects. Learning objects were seen as the biggest thing in education for a number of years, where we'd have all of these learning objects that teachers could combine in various ways and produce lessons by structuring how these learning objects are used and presented. Unfortunately, the developers of the learning objects uh, tended to combine them into more complex activities that became self-contained. And so it wasn't easy to then use these activities in a mix and match way, which was the original intent of learning objects. And it was also that to make them work, you had to record a lot of what, what is called metadata, um, how the objects were meant to be used and what they could do. So you could search for and find particular learning objects that you would like to use in a particular circumstance. But unfortunately, most people didn't want to spend the time to actually uh, complete the metadata. And so it never really got to the point where learning objects became very popular and usable. What are some people's thoughts about that before we go on to drill and practice and other concepts? I think that's one of the reasons why teachers are so um, apprehensive regarding learning objects because they can be quite difficult to elaborate, you know, to gather all the resources you may need for that. And when you start thinking about things like metadata and other words, they will just get scared. It's like, I don't know how I'm gonna handle that. But I think sometimes learning objects is very similar to what you can use in that Moodle or Moodle, if you know how to use the resources correctly. Although uh, I think if I can remember correctly on Moodle, you use uh, keywords instead of metadata. So it's easier to locate the resources. You do, that. it's still metadata, it's just uh, reframed as a different term. Um, and yes, you're correct. Learning objects still exist and they can be used, but they've never gone to their, the potential that was perceived. The idea was that all learning activities would be an arrangement of learning objects. And you would have every picture and video that you might want, and you could drag those in and include them with quizzes and the idea that all of those things would be made by others and you would just re remix and match them as you wanted to frame a learning experience. Um, unfortunately, the money went more towards the developers rather than identifying lots of very small atomized learning objects. And those developers tended to want to make self-contained learning experiences around a particular theme or learning outcome and they didn't want to break their um, that experience down into a whole lot of reusable objects, which was the original intent of the learning object framework. So the government has spent, Australian government spent till probably close to $100 million over the last 10 years um, investing in learning objects, because it was seen as a, 
way of really advancing education in Australia. But no one really ended up wanting to use them because they were always clumped together and most teachers want to um, design their own learning experiences uh, more so than use the ones that other people have already created. Beginning teachers and teachers new to a subject area will certainly want to use existing resources, but in the main, because curriculum changes so often and learning outcomes are required to change as a result of that, um, the pre-existing material that's been created tends to have a fairly short lifespan. Um, Flash is a good example of that. Most of the resources were made using a technology called Flash, which is now relatively redundant. Um, it's no longer supported by a number of major platforms, mostly Apple's fault. But because Flash introduced a lot of potential vulnerabilities into computer systems, it became less um, use, used by various systems. And so hundreds of, well, not, not hundreds of millions, but many millions of dollars worth of investment into learning objects was lost because of the platform that it was developed with. And yes, HTML5 is designed to address that um, and to make that uh, less of a problem. And a lot of the material is slowly being reported into a HTML5 format, but that still costs money. Um, there's so many objects and resources that have been developed for the Flash format that um, it's difficult to convert it all over quickly. Okay, so let's then look at the last little bit in that section. Okay, so this is, so the main Australian repository is called Scootle, where there are lots and lots of learning objects available. Unfortunately, you do have to be an Australian teacher generally to get access to that. There are a few other ways in, but um, because of copyright restrictions, it was fairly locked down. And that was un unfortunately one of the reasons why it's pretty much failed because the resources there have barriers to easy access. Um, and the more barriers you put in place around systems, the less likely teachers and others are, are to engage with that system. Of course, as they come to barriers, that ten, tends to provide them an excuse not to continue to engage with that system. But learning objects do exist. There's lots of different formats for them, but they tend to have sort of five main requirements. Um, most of them are around drill and practice activities, but more and more that has merged into other tools such as Mathletic online games and other systems that allow students to engage with lots of practice with their learning. And increasingly, we're seeing the rise of intelligence tut intelligent tutoring systems. Um, now, these have been around for decades, but they're getting progressively more powerful as our understanding of AI and chat-based systems is increasing. Uh, the Khan Academy, which many of you probably have heard of, which started off as a collection of videos, is now being turned into an intelligent tutoring system with a large investment by Microsoft um, to allow it to track student progress and adjust the presentation of concepts depending upon how students are learning and how they've gone with previous experiences. So that's sort of where that state of play is just at the moment. Any thoughts? So Scoodle is supposed to be used by all teachers? Yes, it was designed as the national repository of um, online learning objects, and all, teach, all teachers in Australia have access to that through their various systems. Some systems, such as Education Queensland, um, reframe the access as though it looks as though you're accessing it through Education Queensland, but it's all accessing really a central repository in Canberra of all the learning objects that are developed. And money is still being put into developing objects, um, and in particular, getting access to large collections of existing objects. So all of the ABC videos and images are now available through Scoodle. Um, 
and other collections that are being made available. And generally, if the government invests money into creating resources, it requires them to be um, made available through the Scoodle platform. Now, Scoodle did have an experimentation with social media and as a forum to promote discussion between teachers. Um, unfortunately, that's failed and it's now being shut down. But that was an example whereby the idea was to get teachers discussing the resources that were available and providing a national framework to support that discussion. Some universities have their own collections. Um, they tend not to be very large ones. But in the main, people can just Google and find lots of resources on their own without particularly needing the use of dedicated databases. The only real advantage of dedicated databases are that they can negotiate copyright clearances and provide access to um, copyrighted material that just doing an open search may not provide access to. Okay, any other questions in general about, okay, how popular is the Khan Academy of Resources in Australia? Um, surprisingly popular, particularly in our senior school um, in the study of physics and mathematics. They've got some very, very high quality resources there um, that allow students to engage with independent learning. Um, I used to regularly terrify maths teachers by showing them how students can put in any mathematics problem into the Khan Academy um, resources and have it show up all the working for that problem. So where maths teachers would commonly just set assignments and, and homework tasks, they could very easily be solved and um, solutions developed using Khan Academy. And there's another one uh, that I've just forgotten at the moment, but also does a similar process. Let me just see if I made mention of it. Um, uh, so this was the Khan Academy and okay. No, I didn't mention it here. I'll probably mention it later on. Um, as mentioned before, manual polling systems have pretty much disappeared now with clickers. We had to purchase a whole set of these clickers and set them all up. And students could respond to lectures and classes um, using those tools. Nowadays, we tend to use um, online systems. Uh, Poll Everywhere is very popular. Votopedia was a free one developed by CSIRO, and I think they're now closed down. Um, let's see if it's still open. No, yep, they're closed. They were really nice because it was free and you could use SMS messages to do your polling. But Poll Everywhere now also supports free SMS um, services. And there's a number of others that are also available. They all do pretty much the same thing. They allow students to respond to questions and um, some of the more advanced aspects now is being able to create a, a word cloud where student responses can generate a word cloud dynamically. Um, other tools are more interactive and game based, um, such as Kahoots, or Kahoot, sorry. Um, it provides a more game based environment where students answer quiz questions and get scores as they progress through a lecture or class. But the more common ones are more based around survey type responses, where you ask questions and it generates a graph or a number of how many responses were made to various options. Okay, Connie asks a question. The personal learning environment in page 21, how does it help in learning? I don't see how Twitter helps in learning. Uh, okay, we might just hold off on that a little bit, Connie, until we get to that section. Let's have a look at the next section, though, on web publishing.
or publishing in general. Most people now are quite familiar with publishing websites. There's lots of tools that can support that. Google Sites is still around, although it's gone through a bit of a transformation into new Google Sites. Um, but there's also portfolio-based systems and where you can create a database of resources. Um, here at Griffith, we're using the PebblePad portfolio system at the moment, but there's lots of others. And you can actually have students create their own digital portfolios. Um, but there's a range of advantages of digital portfolios. Students can create a record of all the learning that they've done and use that to provide evidence of their learning. They can use it for when they want to go for jobs after their courses are finished. Uh, they can use it as a reflective process to reflect upon their learning uh, and various other approaches that I mentioned throughout here. But Portfolios have, in the main, been replaced by personal learning environments. This is where the idea is that students might have their own web, web pages or websites, and they can use that to achieve a whole range of goals, including a portfolio type approach. Um, there are a number of universities and schools that provide every student a personal website when they enroll and that they can keep after they leave the, that institution. And the idea is that students can use it to craft their own digital presence and provide evidence or information about themselves as a learner uh, that can be used by potential employers, their own reflective practices, or to meet assignment requirements and things of that nature. And within that, there's lots and lots of tools available. Blogs have been around probably the longest, which are web logs or basically a diary. Um, and each new entry into the diary goes at the front and people can look back through the diary to see previous posts to blogs over time. They're not structured in any way more than that, but people can subscribe to blogs. And so whenever a new, a new post is, is made, um, they'll receive that and they can then read the update that the person or organization has wanted to share. So they're a nice, effective way of sharing information that's relatively regular, uh, but time-based. Wikis, on the other hand, have more of a structure. They're more like an encyclopedia, and indeed the most popular wiki is Wikipedia. And they're structured around providing links between concepts. Generally, each idea or concept or topic has its own page, and it can link to other pages of different concepts and topics. And over time, that can build up into a very large collection of interrelated ideas and concepts. Um, various computer games and movies have had really quite extensive wikis developed. Minecraft and World of Warcraft have got very large ones, numbering hundreds of thousands of pages of information. And likewise, the Lord of the Rings and Tolkien have got um, very large Wikipedia, wiki type um, environments that people can then search through and explore. Now, the real strength of wikis have been, though, is that because they're online, they can allow open public, uh, open contributions. So, for example, Wikipedia was originally set up so that anyone could add a new entry, and through a voting process and uh, collective editing process, it could be improved upon. And you may have some people come in and say, no, that's probably not correct. And if enough people vote on that and say that that's so, then it's changed so that it more reflects uh, what's currently occurring. And Wikipedia and a couple of other digital um, encyclopedias have pretty much replaced printed encyclopedias at this point. They still have their challenges. There can be inaccuracies, but there has been found through research that there is actually fewer inaccuracies in wiki-based encyclopedias than in more traditional encyclopedias. But wikis are, Wikipedia is evolving, and it's using more and more experts that have got permission to edit the encyclopedia, much as traditional encyclopedias used, because particularly around issues that are controversial and may see a lot of um, public editing that is trying to sway people on other agendas. 
So what do people think about wikis and blogs? Does everyone trust Wikipedia? Usually it's like, it, it, it guides you, but you don't trust it completely because there's so many people there that you just don't know if they are actually doing a good job in editing or not. They could be biased when they're editing the information. So that's why it's like a gateway, you know? It gives you an, an overall idea of whatever you're trying to understand, and that's it. But if you want to go more in depth, usually that's when you say no. But it gives you like keywords that you can start looking somewhere else and go to a more, you know, like more respectable sources, then you can start actually elaborating on that. I never used wikis because it, at the end of the term, it will be just a mess. Everyone will start, you know, placing conflicting opinions inside the, the text. So it was like when people were reading, they didn't know if actually they were agreeing or disagreeing because they could not elaborate properly. So it was like, I said, no, that's this is the last time I use it because it needs training. So you need to teach them how to be more critical about what they write and approach in a different way. Yes, now you're absolutely correct. Wikis can be difficult to manage. Um, but that said, they can be a useful assessment tool or uh, used as more like a mind map throughout a course for students to structure their ideas and present their understanding via the complexity of the of the links and the structuring of how they've presented information in a wiki format. Um, trying to replicate Wikipedia in a course would be difficult because you would get conflicting perspectives. But there has been quite a lot of success done by many um, teachers, particularly in K-12, of having students create little, little mini encyclopedias based around the concepts that are being taught and the teacher then assessing students on their contributions and the accuracy of those contributions. So for example, around astronomy or some aspects of physics, where the students build out a more, an increasingly complex uh, wiki and the teacher monitors that progress and guides it and identifies errors as they're occurring. But it is challenging. Now we also have a few mentions that blogs are good for personalized or thematic content and interest-based. Yes, because of the diary nature of blogs, they can be um, they can be challenging to use uh, as a way of resourcing or providing access to resources. They are difficult because good resources will eventually disappear down into the chain of the blog, um, particularly if those resources are being shared over a long period of time. But that said, they can provide very up to date information. And that's probably the biggest advantage of both wikis and blogs in that as soon as things occur, they tend to be updated much more quickly through these platforms than other forms of publishing. And yes, Adrian's tagging can be used, but again, the whole concept of search versus directories um, is an ongoing problem in computing. Google has tried very hard to get people to move towards the idea of just searching rather than having a structure that you look through to get access to information. And wikis really do represent that structural approach, um, which is sort of the opposite of where Google would like to see things move, um, which you'd search through for keywords and things of that nature. But that debate's been around since the very beginning of the internet uh, and the very beginning of search engines. There was always two different types of search engines, ones that had a directory and ones that simply had a search um, entry point where you typed in some text. But it's generally been found that Google has won that battle uh, with the idea of just searching for terms and most of the directory structures have died away. Um, Yahoo probably was one of the last ones to keep a very large directory structure going. But because of the amount of information and the complexity of information available on the internet, the directories just became too unwieldy and it took too long to search through them to find effective information. 
But they were good for a long time, and lots of teachers really enjoyed them because they liked creating their own directories. Of course, they were used to that in how they structured information from textbooks and presented information on their own websites to students. Uh, now, not quite like the operating system directories. These are more um, list of, of terms. Um, so what would be an equivalent today? Probably things like Netflix, where you see a whole lot of pictures of the movies that you might want to look at. And you could look at different categories of movies. And those categories represent a directory structure. Now, because there's only a few hundred movies, the directory structure can sustain that. But once you get to tens of thousands of movies, it takes too long to find what you want, it want in that directory structure. And then a search structure or a search approach is more effective. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Oops. So then we've got the whole idea of digital books. These were very popular for a while, uh, particularly with Apple's iBooks. Um, and a lot of work was put into trying to make these effective. And indeed, they are proving very effective. A lot of, a lot of um, our texts now are provided digitally. Of course, it's just so much cheaper to distribute than previously. Um, the fact that it's cheaper to distribute doesn't mean, though, that publishers have given up the profit margins that they want to achieve. And that's been one of the biggest problems with digital texts, that they often cost as much or in some cases even more than the printed versions because publishers want to keep making the money that they can um, from the publishing process. But it is now possible to self-author um, text far more easily than it has been in the past. And iBooks and iTunes U and things of that nature have made that very, very easy. Unfortunately, with both iBooks Author and iTunes U, they're proprietary just to Apple, Apple's platform, uh, which severely limits their usability. Um, it certainly helps enhance Apple's platform, but it makes their use, say in this course, much more problematic because I have to provide a PDF version, which is not as effective, and an iBooks um, version, which can have all the interactivity that can be achieved with iBooks, where you can include quizzes and video clips and track student progress through their reading and do quite a lot as though it's effectively a mini learning management system. But while it remains proprietary just to Apple, as much as I love iBooks author and I, iBooks, um, it really does limit what can be effectively used for that. Similarly with iTunes U, as a learning management system, uh, providing access to iBooks and other resources, it is again limited somewhat by being platform dependent. Now, in iBooks, there is the opportunity to include what are called widgets, which are small little applications that can do various things, which might present a game or allow a particular thing to occur in that iBook, far beyond what we would normally expect to see in a uh, PDF type text. And then we have various aspects around increasing ability to create our own graphics and create our own video. Um, from the simple GIF sequences of animated pictures through to creating screencasts, which is what I do for your courses, uh, recording what is happening on my screen and sharing that to you through to video editing and creating quite professional video productions. And then even moving into an area called of 3D modeling, where instead of creating static images, creating 3D models of objects, and then recording those objects in different environments and in different configurations. And so if you go to the process and the and the um, the time to actually create a whole 3D model, you can then record various walkthroughs and, and engagements with that um, and alter that in different ways. It is far more difficult to do with um, single perspective video 
uh, editing. And then you can include things into your text like movable objects and things of that nature. Hasn't really taken off hugely, but particularly in areas such as design and technology, it's proving to be quite um, useful around some concepts. The only thing I'll add to this is a few more recent advances, primarily around 3D video, where we can now record um, a video with cameras that can see all around them. And so you can then change your point of view and look from different directions at what is occurring. And I'm using that in a number of my courses at the moment, particularly for use in tutorials, where a single point of view doesn't capture the experience particularly well because I move around the classroom quite a lot. But a 3D camera can record the entire space and so viewers can move their perspective as I move around the classroom. Um, and there's a number of other uses for it, particularly if it's combined with virtual reality and students can put on virtual reality headsets and then look around the 3D space quite easily without having to use their mouse and other things of that nature. Okay, any other questions, comments, or elaborations on anything we've talked about in the ICT text? Oh, good. Sorry. My apologies. Connie's Twitter question. Yes, the use of social media does present various challenges, but it has proven to be quite effective in a number of um, learning spaces. Probably the space I find the most use is at conferences, where we have a large number of people, and, and in lectures, where you've got a large number of people observing and wanting to be able to comment on what is being discussed without it being more formal discussions. So I tend to use Twitter at almost any conference I'm at, and I use it as a summary tool, where by making comment on what's being presented, taking photos and submitting those to Twitter, or discussing whether or not I agree or disagree with various comments being made by the presenter, I can then have a recording of that discussion. But it's also then not my discussion, it can be a shared discussion where a number of people are commenting about what's being um, shared and quite complex, what are called back channel discussions can occur. Um, and the presenter may be even completely oblivious to this. So while they are presenting a lesson or a presentation at a conference, people can be having a quite heated discussion about what they're presenting and maybe being quite critical or very supportive of what the presenter is doing. And that can worry a lot of presenters. Um, in the very early st stages of Twitter, there was a lot of presenters that didn't want it to be used while they were presenting. Of course, they didn't have control of the learning space and what was occurring there. But generally now, it's quite accepted that Twitter is an effective tool for sh having an um, informal discussion about public events and things occurring. That said, there are people that use Twitter for other purposes. A lot of people use it to follow personalities and things of that nature. And in the main, if there's been a significant event occurring, people share things on Twitter before other uh, mechanisms. So if there's a revolution somewhere or a natural disaster, you can generally find out about it and find out a lot of detail about that on Twitter. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that that detail is accurate. And you have to go through a whole process of critical thinking around that. But more than most other platforms, it provides an opportunity for those that are eyewitnesses or experiencing the events that are occurring to share that. Now, the atmosphere of Twitter is quite unique, um, particularly when it was limited to 40 characters. It had to be a very brief comment or statement. and Sometimes that doesn't promote a positive um, conversation. Of course, people resort to very 
simplistic arguments without going into a lot of detail. But for what it's capable of doing, it is quite popular for that. And yes, sometimes people can be rude, um, but you don't necessarily have to follow those people. And generally in an educational environment, you maintain some control over that. And by using what are called hashtags, you set things up so that only the conversations where people are including that hashtag, which might be hash um, new technologies. So if we had that and any tweets that we made included that hashtag, then by following that hashtag, we would only see messages that included that hashtag. And that's how in an educational environment, we can keep out um, random comments and random um, discussions like that. Or if they do occur, we can then follow that up with particular students and provide them guidance with how they should be um, having that conversation. But because it is a public environment and it is very public, um, there can be quite rude comments and a lot of people do bullying through Twitter and other social media forms. Of course, they do see it as a semi-anonymous um, space. Of course, you can make up your own um, name and use that in Twitter and it's very difficult for that then to be traced back to a real person. So that level of um, anonymity does uh, does encourage some people to be quite rude and offensive and generally we call those people trolls who are, are, they find pleasure in creating sensation and so the, the ruder they are or the more offensive they are that is their intent. Um, but in the main, they're relatively, well, I can't say a minority, but in educational environments, particularly through the use of hashtags, we can sort of limit their impact. So any other questions or comments about any of the material in the ICT text? Okay, then let's look at the other text, which is ICT integration. Here we focus less on the technologies and more on the processes of using those technologies to achieve various outcomes. Uh, where are we? Um, oops, let me just refresh my page. Okay, so the first aspect around most approaches of IC integration is that we're facing quite complex change. And coping with that change is something that we have to learn to do ourselves and to support others in their attempts to cope with that change, particularly our students, but often our colleagues as well. And a big part of your second assignment will be focusing on that change process and bringing others on board with the change that you would like to see happen in your educational organization. And there are challenges. We've talked a bit about the innovators in the early majority and late majority, etc. And a friend of mine, Lindy McEwen, developed this pencil metaphor, where for any group of teachers, there's a few at the very front who are leaders, and they're represented by the lead, at the very tip. Then there are the sharp ones who are the early adopters. So they follow what the leaders are doing and are very quick to adopt those and explore them with their students. Then we have the majority who are the wood. Um, and if they're given support and the equipment and kept having everything working well, they'll engage with the approaches. 
But there's always a few that are the deadwood, who are the laggards. They're the ones that are very difficult to engage with um, and generally have to have everyone else moving before that they'll get involved. And then there's a few that are opposed to what you may be doing. They're the erasers, they attempt to um, subvert. And then there's the hanger-ons. They're the ones that will, um, they tend to go onto the conference circuits and they, they present about these ideas, but they never actually do them themselves. They, they just sort of find out about all the good ideas and go around sharing those without ever really trying to experience them or put them into their own practice. We have this hype cycle from the Gartner's research where every year or so they develop this hype cycle which tracks innovations in educational technologies. And they've found that most new technologies go through a process where they're introduced and everyone gets really excited about them. And then the expectations of what the technology is going to be able to achieve become very, very high. So for example, virtual reality, where every student will be wearing virtual reality headsets and all the learning will occur through virtual reality and everyone will have it. But as the technology is explored and people start trying to put it into practice, we then go through what's called the trough of disillusionment, where the illusions of what we thought were going to be possible become face the reality of the actual learning spaces. And that can often almost kill off new advances in technologies. And we drop down quite a lot and the technology becomes less and less popular because of that. But then over time, we accept the limitations and we go slowly up the slope of enlightenment where the technology becomes increasingly incorporated into the learning spaces to when we get to the plateau of productivity where it starts being really effectively used by lots of people. But almost every technology seems to go through this hype cycle. Um, and it's just something that's accepted nowadays that something new is going to get a lot of attention, a lot of media, a lot of people will be speaking about it as the latest big thing. Um, a lot of people will get behind it, but then it'll go through a, a rapid decrease in popularity. And if it survives that, it'll then start slowly improving again. We've talked about the horizon reports and those as a resource. But what do people think about the general explanations of learning environments and the processes we go about introduct, introducing new educational technologies as I've discussed here? Ideas, thoughts, comments, arguments? Remembering you do have a mute off button. Well, when you think about change and challenges, and then you see the hype cycle, it's understandable that sometimes technology gives you that pump, like, oh my God, this is very interesting. This looks like something I can do. And then you have to face reality. And then you start seeing a lot of things coming up like resources, budget, funding, uh, policy, depending on what's, th there are multiple factors there. Well, it's a system. So there are a lot of things that will start affecting how these technologies can be implemented. But some, when you look at the hype cycle, it's like everything that it's new goes up in the, in the scale. And those that actually seem to be more accessible tend to be lower, like media tablets or tablets in general. Actually bringing your own device shouldn't be that part because now most people have access to tablets or mobile devices, even in developing countries. Yes, now that, so, graph, that graph is about five years old. There's been more okay. recent ones produced since then. That would, yeah, because it's like, yeah, the cycle is very inter interesting. And actually, television is starting to die slowly because most people now prefer streaming services. Mm -hmm. So it's like people doesn't watch television. Instead, they switch to Netflix or Google or Google movies or something that responds more to what they actually want to see. And there are streaming uh, 
you can actually go to CNN and other places and actually see a stream live instead of watching television. So television is like one of those that at the beginning, when it com came up, all teachers started using it. And now it's like nobody thinks of television as a technological tool. They think it's dated and no longer usable, hmm. but it still has potential. I mean, Discovery Channel has a lot of very interesting things that you can use in a classroom too. But people, it's like, sometimes they look to technology and something that is really new tends to move something that's been going, that's been around for a while. So how do actually we can, or how we measure the effectiveness of these digital technologies? It's only a matter of actually seeing what we're using and what's coming or actually working on what we already have and make a good use of it. Well, that's a very good point. And there are a number of um, research studies that explore the uses of various technologies. But in the main, it's really because we can use them in so many different contexts. As you mentioned with TV, uh, TV still has a great use for lots of different um, contexts and learning outcomes. Just the fact that there is a, a replacement for television doesn't necessarily mean that it will automatically be replaced in all circumstances. There may be times when it is still more preferable, um, particularly here in Australia where we've got free to air television and less than ideal internet. Um, television can be quite effective in a lot of circumstances. Whereas in the United States where the reverse is really true, where they've got very poor free to air television, but very good internet connectivity, the take up of alternatives to television there have been progressing quite a bit faster than here in Australia. Um, but yes, there's, there's lots of things about the advantages of certain technologies over other technologies. I'm in the process of doing a major study throughout Australia where we're doing a Delphi study, the Australian Educational Technologies Trends Survey, where we go through and rank all the different technologies and what we think are the most effective, the most um, how the value for money for various technologies and how effectively they approach and support different um, teaching approaches and pedagogies. So those sorts of surveys do exist, but they are fairly rare. But you do make a good point around um, trying to identify whether or not a technology is the most appropriate for your particular circumstance. And in your second assignment, part of that will be justifying um, why you've chosen various technologies. And you can use your first assignment, the Delphi study, to help provide that justification. Other aspects of that first page of the integration text. Yes, the MBN started off as a very good idea of giving the same level of access to everybody. But unfortunately, when that ideal disappeared, a lot of its benefit has um, also gone. And it's really now just an, a new monopoly that is replacing an existing monopoly. Um, okay. <laughs> Well, yes, I guess there are more practical implications of the NBN um, other than just internet connectivity. Let's have a look at the next section. So the whole idea of integration has been around for a number of years. And this is the idea that we move to make the use of various ICTs and technologies, um, seamless and ubiquitous within our organizations. So initially, we'll often start with this idea of inaction, where teachers are not engaged with the new technologies. Then they'll start investigating them. Then they'll start applying their use in certain circumstances. But there's a particular critical use board where it's got to get to a certain level of um, requirement or effectiveness 
before teachers will move over that barrier to truly integrating it, where they use the ICT um, seamlessly in all of their learning experiences. So the idea is not to have it as an exception, but just as a natural part of everyday use. A bit like what we would think of as the internet or word processing software, um, to a certain extent PowerPoint and presentation software. Those have passed over that critical use border and they're fully integrated in what we do. But there are a lot of other ICTs that haven't passed that boundary yet. And then eventually we move into an area called transformation. And this is where we start looking for new ways of using that ICT to support learning, ways that haven't been done before. Um, and that's quite rare because of the nature of that, but it's where we would like to see teachers eventually getting to. So ICT has been around as a term for a long time. Um, technically, it means uh, information and communications technologies but it has various other terms that have been applied to it. But essentially, it's just all of the tools that we use in everyday work and learning and so forth. ICT capability is how students can have the capacity to use those tools to enhance their learning and various other uses. And there's a range of little video clips there that promote the use of ICT and support its integration. Okay, now we get to this concept of modeling. The first model that we have is the SAMA model. This is substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. The idea is that any use of technology will fall into one of those categories, and that they're not necessarily better than one another, but they're different. Um, but unfortunately, most teachers stay within the substitution field without moving into exploring the other options. But substitution is where we take a technology and we replace an existing way of doing things or an existing technology with that technology. So a good example is the interactive whiteboard. If it was simply being used to replace the blackboard or the whiteboard um, without using its video capabilities or its apps or anything like that, then it was really just acting as a substitution. And likewise, if you just use an online word processor, such as Google Docs, without doing any of the sharing capabilities or group work capabilities, um, but just use it as a replacement for Word on your desktop machine, um, then it really was simply just substitution. If you started using some of the capabilities, such as allowing multiple authors to work on a document at once, or sharing that document to others around the world very easily by using the share button, then that would be things like augmentation, where we're doing more than just substitution. We're enhancing the use and ex learning experience by using those capabilities, but it's not really doing anything really different. We're still just basically word processing, but we're doing it more effectively and efficiently because of the uh, capabilities of new technologies. Modification is where we can start doing things quite differently and doing things that we couldn't really do um, with the existing processes and existing technologies. So let's have a look at some of the examples that I've listed here. Um, so this is looking at some of the tools that support modification. But one example might be online polling. In the past, doing an online poll, um, well, doing a poll of your students would involve giving them all a piece of paper, them filling that out, handing back all those pieces of paper, someone looking at them all and tallying things up, and then letting everyone know what the results were. Now, that was quite laborious and difficult and complicated. Online polling allows us to do things in quite a different way from that. We can have everyone contribute their results automatically through their devices. We can have that automatically be tallied and automatically presented. But beyond that, we can also start structuring that information in ways that we couldn't in a manual system, such as creating a dynamic word cloud. So this is a modification that allows us to do things that weren't possible with a previous way of doing that same process. And the 
final one would be what's called redefinition. And this is where we, we re, completely redefine how we go about doing what we were doing. Um, again, different examples and options there. Let me get into one of the examples in this matrix. Um, where have I got it? Okay, the technology matrix takes this summer model and provides a structure around that. So here, if I go into one of them, uh, where's a the large one? Oh, I can't do it on this computer. Um, in iBooks, these would become larger as you tap on them. Unfortunately, here, all I can do is zoom in. Let me see. And that's the limit of my zoom. One second. Okay. So here we're looking at various ways of integrating technology that might be transformative. Um, what's the approach here? Oh, okay, this is just looking at different pedagogical approaches. Um, but allowing students to transform uh, let me find one on technology that was more related to what we're talking about. Okay, let's grab an example that you'll understand. Okay, so let's say in, in science, we're looking at mapping and testing. I'll just jump to this example. Hopefully, here we are. No, it's gone. Okay. Whoops, no, maybe. Okay. So here the example is using data collection and um, automated data devices. Uh, data, oh, what do we call it? Not data polling. Um, uh, devices that can automatically capture information about the environment, such as it might be uh, pH levels or um, temperature levels and students can carry these around and use them on an excursion and collect lots of data that would have been almost impossible to do by carrying around um, thermometers and pH meters and a whole lot of other equipment. So in the past when we did that sort of thing in science we would have to invest a lot of money to go to a single location set up lots of equipment and collect that data. Nowadays they can have these this sort of equipment attached to almost any smartphone or smart device, collect a huge amount of data that students can then actually start working with while they're on site. So instead of having to collect a whole lot of raw data, take it back to a laboratory, analyze it all on the computers and then try to work out what it all meant, students can start taking readings while they're in the environment, seeing what's occurring and then looking around and exploring that environment to try to understand why it is occurring. And so that's an example of a transformational technology that allows the process of science to occur differently to how it would have occurred previously to that technology. Any questions, comments, statements, or arguments? Um, we can use one of these three models as uh, the one we can use uh, for the intervention in the system we are analyzing, right? You can, yes. And you may find uh, various aspects of all of them that you might want to incorporate elements of, because they all provide certain advantages. But are these the only models or there are more models? There are more, but these are the most popular ones and, and by far the most commonly used ones. Um, lots of lots of academics make up their own models, but it tends to be only those that gain traction that became very popular. All the models that I'm showing you are used by tens of thousands of academics throughout the world. So they're the main models that are being used. It's not to say that they're perfect, and there are other models that exist, but 
they're the ones that you will most commonly come across in any um, research and text. What do others think? Connie, Adrian, or Hadis? All of you all off watching Netflix. Yes, Adrian, the, the TPAC model is also a nice tool that you can use. <laughs> Good to hear, Adrian. <laughs> But the TPAC model is particularly useful for comparing approaches. Uh, and that's quite different to the SAMA model, which is more useful in trying to understand the engagement people have with different levels of technology. TPAC doesn't provide levels. It simply provides the interaction between technology, um, content, and pedagogy. While the SAMA model provides you with four levels of engagement. And so you can use that to try to make judgments about how effectively or to what degree your teachers or participants in your organization are engaging with what you wish to introduce. Okay, let's look further on. And so the TPAC model, as we've discussed before, but here it is again, it provides you with a good structure for thinking about whether or not the technology you're using matches well with the content that you want to teach and the pedagogical approach you want to use for that teaching. And again, a very popular model, but it does a different job to the SAMA model. And this model, the, what do they call it? Um, what do they call it? The Technologies Integration Matrix really is a SAMA model, but elaborated on. And so it gives you lots of examples of where things have been transformative and where they've been less transformative. But it also brings in concepts of pedagogy. So different approaches to teaching, whether it's active teaching, collaborative teaching, constructive, authentic, or goal-orientated. And so it combines a little bit of the TPAC concept of pedagogy and technology, but the main process is to look at whether or not teachers are engaging with different levels and types of um, engagement with technology, where the TPAC model simply says whether or not they're engaging with technology um, in relationship to content and pedagogy. And lots of examples there, you can read about the TPAC model. Now the last bit to look at are the expectations we set for what teachers should be doing with technology. And there are a number of expectations that we can have. There's some professional standards. Um, in Australia, we have a set of professional standards of what we expect teachers to do. And part of that is ICTs. And I've given you there the links to the ATSL graduate ICT standards. So what we would expect of all graduates and accomplished teachers, et cetera, in their use of technology. And there's some elaborations here about what would be expected. and various examples. Now in Queensland, we did have for seven years or so, a very comprehensive um, set of standards called the smart classrooms. And teachers could apply to move up through three levels of certification within that. Um, and it was all linked to not only their promotion, but also their principal's promotion. So, it proved very, very effective in doing so because all of the principals encouraged their staff to engage with the standards and they wanted to have as many staff as they could 
being advanced license holders because it increased their promotion prospects. Um, but it was a quite a good standard, but unfortunately it was discontinued about five years ago now. Um, but for its time, it was very, very effective. But there are also international standards. Um, the NET standard and the ISTE standards are probably the most popular, particularly in the United States, which set out a whole series of standards of what teachers and principals and students should be aiming to in their in integration and use of ICT. But we also have the UNESCO standards. UNESCO ones are probably a little bit behind in that they're more skill-based um, and focused more on um, gaining capacity around a set of ICT skills and demonstrating that, while the ISTE standards and the Australian standards tend to be more around how well teachers use that ICT for teaching and learning, how well they integrate it with pedagogy and things of that nature. Um, the UNESCO ICT standards, which are by far more popular in Europe, tend to be more focused on whether or not teachers can demonstrate competency with various um, technologies. And then in Australia, in our K-12 schools, we now also have the ICT general capabilities, which set out a curriculum for developing ICT skills in our students from the years um, grade, basic grade one through to grade 10. And there's a whole range of capacities that are built up. And that's the general framework. Students need to know how to communicate with technology, create with technology, investigate with technology, manage and operate technology, but also to consider the social and ethical protocols and practices, particularly around safe use of the internet and things of that nature. And that forms a framework that all Australian school students now learn about this technology. And they do so through all of their subjects. Queensland has its own set of ICT expectations for students as well, which is fairly similar to the national standards. And there's also international standards for students. So what do people think about the standards that are being set? Are they appropriate? Is that the sort of things that we would expect students nowadays to have an understanding of? Or are there things that we are missing out and students aren't developing? Last week, we talked about the new subject of digital um, technologies and the idea of learning about coding and other aspects of um, computer science. But that's somewhat different to ICT. ICT is how to use the technologies. Um, digital technologies is more about how to create the technologies. And yes, it's a big challenge. And in fact, the challenge for teachers is actually greater than for students. Because teachers have gone through their own schooling without having any real experience with this. Um, the students are going through and learning about it as part of their schooling where teachers have to come through to it and teach about something that they've never actually experienced themselves. And that is tough. And yes, there is that aspect of old dogs and new tricks. Um, in the main, most teachers do continuously learn, but having to learn an entirely new subject is quite difficult. We only... The last time we introduced a new subject into schools was in the 60s, which was geography. And before that, in the 50s, we introduced science. So it's quite rare for us to introduce new subjects into um, K-12 schooling. And yes, the whole idea of digital natives is, well, it depends upon how you actually define digital natives and what you're trying to mean by that. Students nowadays do engage more with technology because they've got greater exposure to it and they are very confident in using technology, far more so than adults. But the expectation that the students will be able to master that technology and go to any level of depth and complexity in the use of that technology without education and without guidance 
is certainly a myth. Uh, now, Henry asks the question, remember the idea, oh, sorry, uh, is more about the access to technology during early development, that transition happens fast and we adapt quickly? Yes, Henry, that's certainly the hope. Uh, and certainly we've seen it in most other industries. Pretty much every industry now is, has embraced and engaged with technology, from medicine through to legal professions, pretty much everywhere. Um, education has been the obvious holdout in that, but because we are a knowledge industry, it is very difficult for us to justify that and to sustain that to any real degree. Some teachers are trying, but they don't really have any way of sustaining it in the long term. Now, Adrian, you mentioned a rural and marginalized context. Do you want to elaborate on that? Oh, in terms of access and inequity, yes. And that's an ongoing issue that we have to consider. Um, but again, as we've, as we've discussed before, while we do have to consider it and make as best allowance for it as we can, we don't want to see it as a factor that holds us back. Um, because that would then be inequitous to everybody. So we have to consider how we can ensure that that inequity doesn't limit the opportunities of all learners, but we don't want to limit all learners' opportunities by focusing on inequity um, to the exclusion of advances in education. Okay, if there's no other comments, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about your assignment. Do any, does anyone have any questions about the first assignment, the Delphi study, that I can address and sh help? Um, or you may want to share the approach that you're taking and we can give advice collectively to support you. Hadis, it's too complicated. Okay, Hadis, which, which bit is too complicated? Let me, let me try to uncomplicate it for you. Now, there are a number of sections to it, and what I would encourage you to do is a process of what's called deconstruction, where you break things down into the smaller sections and focus on those. They do tend to flow one to, e to each other, and so you can complete them as like little mini tasks that will then collectively produce an overall result for you. Uh, why should we take two surveys? That's a good question. Um, essentially, because we are modeling the Delphi process, the Delphi process requires at least two rounds of surveying for it to be defined as a Delphi process. Otherwise, it's just a survey. Um, so we're not really surveying, we're engaging with the Delphi process. And indeed, some argue that the Delphi process should include at least three rounds. Yes, you can ask one another to be your experts. Uh, you'll probably still need a few extra, uh, extra people, but certainly, yes, you can do that. And I suggest you do that through the Facebook chat system where you can ask questions of each other and get some things happening there. But yes, you're more than welcome to help use each other as experts. How do you make the survey? Um, okay, we. We generally we went through that process in our demonstrations assignment, but let me share my screen and I'll take you through that very quickly. Um, where am I again? No, it's online, so it's through a web page. Uh, so I just need to go back to last week's. Actually, it's probably here on this week. No, it's not. Okay. 
So the last few weeks we've been going through a sample Delphi process and using the tool somewhere here. Here we are. So to create your own, uh, where will it let us go? Uh, if you click on here, so you click on just that corner of it, and you can now go create. I'm sort of in a little window here, but um, this is the process. You can give the question that you want to ask. You can create your own URL, so it makes a bit more sense than just having a random thing. So related to the question, and then you can add a few of your add your I think it's ten ideas or twelve ideas that you need to put in that your participants are going to vote upon. And then if you put in your email and password, um, you'll then have created your own um, Delphi survey. So that's pretty much all that's involved in that. I'll put some instructions related to that um, on the email that I send out each week, just to help clarify that for you. Now, unfortunately, SurveyMonkey won't do the Delphi process. Uh, there are other tools that I've used in the past that are far more complicated, um, but this tool is extremely simple to use. So it's much easier to use than almost any other tool that I've been able to come across. Is there any guidelines we need to justify our 10 to 12 answers? Well, let's have a look at the criteria. Hello. Yes. Could you please just explain the assignment one step by step for us? I just want to make sure that we are in the right track. Okay. So if you go to the assignment page, you'll see there that there's six steps. Um, you need to decide upon an, an organization that you're going to be supporting. Uh, and you can use system modeling that we looked at in week two to create a connection circle and flow map that explains your organization. And from that flow map, you should then identify a question that you want to ask. So that's the challenge that you select. And you then develop 10 questions to ask your experts in relation to that challenge. Uh, do we have to draw a flow map in the assignment? You do have to explain, let me check. You do have to provide a systems model. Now, the easiest way of providing a systems model is through a flow map. Um, there are other ways, but a simple connection circle or flow map would be the easiest way of doing that. It doesn't need to be absolutely correct in terms of making it into a simulation, but it does need to be enough to help explain your organization and to allow you to identify a problem to be solved within that organization. So review the material we went through in, the, in those first weeks, looking at uh, systems thinking and creating flow maps and connection circles and it's a fairly simple process to be able to identify um, a number of interconnections and to use that to identify a problem that you can ask your experts. So in terms of asking your experts, that's part of the criteria that there should be some relationship to the question that you've come up with and the system model that you've explored. Then you go through two rounds of the Delphi survey. And the easiest way to do that is to create two separate all our ideas um, surveys um, and have your experts do them twice. But do them once, look at the results, and then do the second survey, reflecting upon what those that first survey 
uh, said was the consensus of the group. That really represents a Delphi study, as opposed to simply a survey. Hi, Jason. Yes. Yeah, so what you're saying is, um, based on the results of the first survey, um, we modify the 10 options for the second survey to adjust for um, um, for the feedback of the first survey? You can, although in general, the Delphi process doesn't say you have to. Um, so we can keep, you can keep just reuse the same. The same. Yeah. And the idea is that people may vote differently now that they've looked at what the consensus was of the first survey. Right, okay. So generally, we can, give them a bit of opportunity to discuss what that first survey said, mm -hmm. and then they vote again, and it really is a check because um, it changes the way people vote. And that's the, the nature of the Delphi process, to try to narrow down and get a consensus. Just so doing a survey doesn't really provide that consensus development process. Right, so the consensus is just to get them to think about the overall um, yeah. results and get them to vote again. Yes. Okay, so we just can keep the 10 options the same then? You can. All right, cool. If you find that one was completely wrong or there was a lot of debate about a particular one, you might want to break it up into two questions. If it was, there might be one that uh, people couldn't really interpret correctly. And so you may want to then make changes as a result of that. But in the main, if they're, if they're well-developed questions and responses, uh, well, a question and responses, then you shouldn't need to make changes. All right. So the challenge then is to come up with a question that uh, isn't too vague, um, but at the same time, go straight to the point in trying to address a problem that you identify. Yes. And remember, you're giving people 10 options and they're going to rank those 10 options. So whatever problem you decide upon, you need to give people 10 uh, possible solutions to that problem. And they'll right. then make a decision as to which of those is the best solution to the problem. Okay. So then it leads to the future, the future scenarios. Um, how, how do we go about that? Is that um... Okay. So once you now have the advice from your experts as to what the best solutions are to your problem, you now write two scenarios. Generally, one will be positive and one will be negative. So one, right. if, if the advice is followed of the experts, um, what is a good outcome from that occurring? And the second one may be, if the advice is not followed, what is the possible outcome in your organization if that expert, expert advice is not followed? Right, yeah, that's a lot clearer now, thanks. Hadis, does that make more sense? Uh, yes, actually it's better. But about the future scenario, I thought that it's going to be if like, we are like going to talk about the positive things will happen if we follow that like uh, voted, you know, at least we are going to get the one answer to the scenario and we are going to apply that things to our problem in our uh, organization and the scenario two will be like if we don't do that uh, these things might happen in the future yes that's essentially what um, I was trying to explain uh, it doesn't have to be exactly like that there is some variation you can use but that would certainly be a valid approach the main and and we are going to predict something and how we can like uh, supporting our ideas. I mean, we should supporting our ideas in just in scenario one and in scenario two, yes? Uh, in the main, you can use your expert opinion to support what you're saying. You may want to introduce other material if you wish and give reference to that. But the majority of your explanation should be supportable from the experts that you've used through the Delphi survey. 
And uh, if my organization is like, because you uh, told before, it's not about the students, it's about something between teachers, if I'm working with the young ages, uh, is it right or no, I will like find something in the classroom because I'm, I'm not sure it is like something that I can apply like between colleagues at that organization or no, uh, something that I'm going to use to teach early ages. Okay. You know what I mean? Because we have a lot of different participants in this course at different levels, you could have your model, your organization could be your classroom or it could be your school or it could be your country. Um, it depends upon where you're at and where your expertise lies, or it could be your university or a university course. Um, so you just have to pick an organization and you can define that. It can't really be so small as to be a single student, but it can certainly be a small class. And it could be like an English language class. That's a very common one. Um, it could be an early childhood center, but it needs to be an organization where you can look at how technology could be incorporated into that organization. And the, tra the, the challenge that you explore and take up may not be how to integrate technology. I'd suggest that's probably a good idea because it will lead in nicely into your second assignment, but you may find other challenges. So a challenge might be um, how to address parental concern with the use of technology, or it might be bullying um, through the use of technology in an organization. It has to have some relationship to technology, but the challenge that you explore can be quite open. And that's where you use that initial system modeling to look at your organization and to try to understand what sort of challenges are facing that organization. But only pick one challenge and develop that up into 10 options of how to solve that challenge as questions for your experts. And the very final part is you need to evaluate the usefulness of what you've come up with um, in terms of supporting decision-making in your organization. And in doing that, you should refer back to your system model that you use to explain things that you develop up in stage one. Now there are criteria sheets associated with this somewhere. That's probably on learning at Griffith. Um, let me just bring that up. And this is also where you'll be submitting your assignment. Oh, Connie has a question, sorry. Um, for the point four initial expert perspectives, do we have to discuss with our experts to know about their perception? Uh, Connie, in the main, no. You can draw that from the responses that they make to the survey. Uh, in a true Delphi survey, everything is done anonymously. And so there's not really an opportunity for that discussion. Sometimes there are anonymous forums set up where people can have more detailed conversations. And there are some Delphi surveys that are done non-anonymously, non uh, which allow that more complex discussion. But in the main, your Delphi survey relies upon those survey questions um, as its main structure and the responses your participants give to those survey questions. Okay, it looks like I've the criteria sheet are not there at the moment. Oh, there they are. So if you go into the assignment and you click on view rubric, it'll show you the actual criteria sheet uh, or the marking rubric. So here you can see the things that I'll be looking for. The complexity of your initial systems model and how you've used that to demonstrate an understanding of your organization, 
your experts and how they've used the Delphi research method to answer your questions, how well you've analyzed those questions and made scenarios out of those questions, out of the responses from your Delphi participants, and then how well you've reflected upon the effectiveness of the, the model that you've um, explored um, to better understand your organization. This will be the extract from the results from the first round. Um, okay, Connie, if you're referring to whether or not you have a discussion about the first round, yes, you can if you wish, or you can simply just present the participants with the results or have them look at the results because they can see them uh, just as you could see the results on the sample one we did. Just have them look at those results, think about what those results might mean, and then give them the second survey to then engage with. So you don't have to build in a discussion process between the two rounds of surveys. And indeed, a true Delphi survey would say not to do that. Is there any questions about the rubric? So that initial systems model is fairly important. It's worth 25%. Getting your uh, participants and constructing your Delphi survey is worth 25%. How you've then drawn the results of that Delphi survey into your scenarios is worth 25%. And that final one is also worth 25%. That's where you then explain how effective your, the process you've been through and the use of the Delphi survey and the model um, gives you better perspective on the organization. Yes, it is, it is reasonably challenging, but I can assure you it's, it's half as difficult as it was last year and the previous year. And students didn't find it too bad then. The tool you're using now is much, much easier than the ones we used previously. And they still have to do all the other aspects that you're looking at. So I think once you find you start working through the process, it's fairly iterative. It, it, well, it leads from one step to the next. And you'll find that again with the second assignment. Again, it'll move from one part of the assignment to the next part to the next, and they'll build upon each other. Yes, the management aspect is more around how you've structured the questions. Um, it used to be a lot more complicated, the management, but the tool we're using now is much easier. So management is not so much of an issue um, now that we're using a very simple tool. But identifying experts, now they don't have to be international experts, they don't have to be world-renowned experts, but they do have to represent the ability to provide some considered um, expertise to the survey process, to the Delphi process. So they can't have no understanding at all of what you're talking about. Yes, the systems model is systems thinking in week two. No, you don't have to describe your preparation and how you've developed the, uh, the process. Um, simply go through Describing your organization. Um, you may want to describe a little bit about how you've selected your experts. But there's not a big focus on that. Okay, any other questions?
Now, what we do in this course is get started and you can share your progress and provide and we'll provide feedback on what you're suggesting you're going to do during the course. So next week, if you've already started, you can share the approach you're doing and ask questions about that and we'll provide you a feedback on how you're going. And for those watching this online, that's a good reason to come along and participate. Okay then, if there's nothing else, we've gone a little bit over time. So we'll wrap things up. Any final questions? Okay. See you all next week.